Good morning, everyone, and um, uh, welcome aboard to uh, Virtual Journal Club. Um, this promises to be a really outstanding session and um, have the opportunity to introduce our presenter um, as well as our esteemed discussant. Um, so Dr. Masha Liv um, Livitz, who is an assistant professor of surgery and endocrine surgery, um, and she is also the fellowship director of the um, Endocrine Surgery Fellowship at UCLA School of Medicine. Um, she completed her general surgery and endocrine surgery fellowship training at UCLA and um, obviously has remained on there on faculty. Her clinical and research interests are both in benign and malignant thyroid, parathyroid um, tumors, as well as familial endocrine disorders. And she has obviously um, taken the lead on uh, running a clinical trial at UCLA that is the subject of our discussion this morning on um, molecular testing for thyroid nodules with indeterminate cytology. Our um, uh, discussant this morning really needs no introduction. It's Dr. Brian McIver, um, who anybody who has been in the thyroid world is quite familiar with his uh, contributions. Um, he has been all over the world um, in terms of his, uh, um, his journey through uh, his um, professional life and education, starting in Edinburgh, where he received his, um, his medical school degree and um, where he did his undergraduate work. And then he actually came over to the University of Vermont to, and this is something I learned, which is one of the great things about having uh, folks come in and getting an opportunity to learn a little bit more about them. He got a PhD in physiology and biophysics and I believe cross-country skiing. Um, is, that, is that correct? Um, which is really an extraordinary degree, but it's, it says that in his bio. Um, he completed uh, his residency in internal medicine at Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. Um, and then I came over to the Mayo Clinic where um, he did a clinical fellowship and also a clinical investigator fellowship in endocrinology. Um, he spent the first part of his career and, um, at Mayo, um, uh, of which half of it was as chair of the Mayo Clinic Thyroid Group, um, and then uh, was appointed in 2011 as founder, a member of the Endowed and Master Clinician Program at the Mayo. Um, currently, uh, Dr. McIver has migrated south um, and is currently um, the appointed deputy uh, physician in chief of the Moffitt Medical Group, in uh, which he assumed that role in 2015. He is responsible for the internal leadership of the oncology clinical practice, which includes over 600 physicians um, and, and advanced practice professionals. Um, Dr. McIver really needs no introduction. He's been involved in the world of um, thyroid nodule, thyroid cancer um, management, and has written extensively and lectured extensively. Um, so with that, um, I will turn the program over to uh, Dr. Livitz. And um, again, thank everybody for joining us and also um, thank our discussants and presenter this morning for your um, agreeing to get up so early. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, is my screen sharing okay? Uh, terrific. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me here today, for inviting me to discuss our work, and I will be presenting our paper, Randomized Control Trial, Effectiveness of Molecular Testing Techniques for Diagnosis of Indeterminate Thyroid Nodules. Um, don't look too closely at our visual abstract. It will reveal all of our study outcomes. I have no disclosures. So the burden of thyroid nodules, over 600,000 thyroid FNAs are performed in the US annually, and the overall risk of malignancy is only about 5%. So most of the thyroid nodules that we discover are benign and can be left alone. And in about 20% of cases, the cytology is indeterminate following FNA, with a risk of malignancy of about 10 to 40%. So how can we improve risk stratification to decrease unnecessary burdensome workup, ultimately to decrease unnecessary diagnostic surgery, but to also identify the perhaps minority of high-risk nodules that require more aggressive treatment? 
So one of these ways is improved ultrasound risk stratification, like the ATA or TIRAD systems, where you can see the figure on the top here is a cystic benign nodule that really does not require any more workup. And then the very high risk nodule at the bottom here with microcalcifications um, that, that we all know is a risk for malignancy. But beyond that, um, this is the example of uh, the dilemma of when the thyroid FNA ends up being indeterminate. This is a patient I took care of many years ago now who was 78 and had an incidental three centimeter thyroid nodule discovered on a surveillance PET CT because he had a history of colon cancer. He was asymptomatic with no risk factors for thyroid cancer. He underwent an ultrasound and a biopsy, which was a follicular lesion of undetermined significance. And a repeat FNA showed the same thing. So at this point, and this was before we had implemented routine molecular testing at our institution, we recommended a diagnostic lobectomy. But the patient said that when he had colon cancer, that he had a biopsy, he had a known malignancy, and that was when his surgeon recommended surgery. However, now we're recommending a lobectomy, but the risk of thyroid cancer is only about 15% with a FLUS diagnosis. So can't we do better than that? And this is where really the role of molecular testing comes in to improve the diagnosis of indeterminate thyroid nodules. So the two, I think, best validated platforms are Affirma, which used to be GEC, relying on mRNA expression, and ThyroSeq V2, now V3, um, which relies on next-generation sequencing of both DNA and RNA. And prior to our study, um, there were no direct comparisons between these tests. And so we were actually struggling at our institution with which test should we use for our patients would have better diagnostic performance. Now we know that the test performance will be affected primarily uh, by the risk of malignancy, especially the PPV. Now, I put the slide up before I knew that Dr. McIver would be the discussant, but um, this is an example. If you look at um, a, a study population where the patients have a risk of malignancy of about, let's say 25%, the positive predictive value of the molecular test, this would be a firm of GEC, was about 37%. However, if the pretest probability of malignancy or the risk of malignancy in a given patient population is lower, only 16, uh, um, um, yeah, only about 15%, then the positive predictive value also decreases to about 16%. So the test may be much less useful in a patient population where there's less malignancy. So given that, it's very hard to compare across studies, and how can we really say which test has better performance when they have not been compared in the same study? So this was what led us to actually design our pragmatic RCT, comparing molecular markers for indeterminate thyroid nodules. We enrolled all patients who underwent thyroid FNA throughout the UCLA health system. We're a very large system. Um, uh, we're geographically spread across many sites, and we have radiology, endocrinology, and endocrine surgery all performing thyroid FNAs in our system. So we randomized patients, and the phase one of our study was comparing the prior test versions of a firm GEC and ThyroSeq V2. We collected a sample of the molecular test at the time of the FNA. So we did not require patients to come back following an indeterminate biopsy result to then get the molecular testing. We reserved a sample for molecular testing at the time of the initial biopsy, and then we reflexively sent it off for all patients who had a Bethesda 3 and 4 result. So this required a lot of sort of resources with keeping of the samples, collecting an additional biopsy sample. Um, however, it also allowed us to obtain molecular testing for all samples so that we were not biased. We decided to block randomize, meaning um, that we would randomize by month. So every given month, we in our entire system either performed GEC or ThyroSeq V2, which really um, allowed us to perform the study because of so many different providers performing thyroid FNAs, randomizing at the patient level was, uh, was very difficult. So we maintained a prospective database and we allowed standard clinical care by the treating physician. So um, the ideal situation in this type of study would be to have surgery for all patients. However, we were already using molecular testing when we started the study. So this is not acceptable to most of our endocrinologists to all of a sudden say patients who before um, with a benign molecular test could be observed all of a sudden needed to have surgery for the study. So we did allow for the standard clinical care, which meant that surgery was recommended for most patients with a suspicious or positive molecular test result. And observation was re recommended for most patients with a benign or negative molecular test result.
And our outcomes were the histopathologic confirmation as the gold standard for patients who had surgery and annual ultrasound surveillance for patients who are managed non-operatively. So the challenges to performing the RCT, um, the first, we needed agreement of all of our stakeholders to use either molecular test. At the time, we were using a firma GEC, and there was more and more data coming out about thioseq B2, but we had no institutional experience. So we needed a lot of education, looking at the studies together to agree that we thought, as far as we know, both of the tests uh, would probably have similar performance. Um, now, the ideal study design also would be to have both molecular tests performed for each nodule. Then you could have a true direct comparison. However, with the cost of the molecular testing being about $3,600, this was cost prohibitive. And the study was designed so that it would be part of standard of care and covered by insurance as far as the molecular testing. So we did randomize instead, as I mentioned. Um, then given how spread out we are, adherence with the randomization schedule um, was, it, was difficult. Um, and so ultimately we decided that the the cytotech technician who was helping us to confirm adequacy at the time of the FNA was in charge of the schedule. And then the last piece was a waiver of consent. Um, so because we were obtaining the molecular test at the time of the thyroid FNA, most biopsy results will be benign and these patients are never even enrolled in the study. So this was a lot of patients for us to enroll at the beginning and a lot of consenting to do. And our IRB did a, agree to let us waive consent. So just briefly, the results of our phase one study when we compared uh, th uh, thyroseq V2 and Affirma GEC, the first part is the benign call rate of GEC was 43%, and that of thyroseq V2 was very high, it was 77%. And along with that, the specificity of Affirma was 66% compared to 90% for thyroseq V2. So our conclusion was that thyroseq V2 had superior benign call rate and specificity. However, we could not really say too much about the sensitivity because most benign thyroid nodules were observed. And so we assumed that they were benign on the basis of a negative or benign molecular test. However, can we really say that? So we then um, published a follow-up uh, about a median of 26 months of the study, and we included the 95 nodules that had a benign molecular test initially. Of those, 12 were immediately resected and 11 were benign and one was a NIFP. And then over the about two years that we followed them, four ended up ha having a malignancy and the overall false negative rate was about 5.8%. And there was no difference between Affirma GEC and ThyroSeq V2 in our study. Now, importantly, all of the nodules, the four that ended up being malignant over the course of the surveillance, all of them had surgery because of an ultrasound change, either a growth in the nodule size or a change in suspicious ultrasound characteristics. So our conclusion was that the false negative risk may be a little bit higher than that of a benign FNA result. However, ultrasound surveillance should detect uh, the, the rare false negatives. Now, is two years really enough time uh, to follow these patients? Um, this was a study of consecutive patients following thyroid FNA, um, looking at those that are benign or malignant and differentiating the growth pattern. And what it really tells you is that over two years of follow-up, most thyroid nodules actually remain stable. Um, so you can't necessarily tell which are benign or malignant um, just based on growth, because even the malignant nodules may remain stable over two years of follow-up time, which we know because most thyroid cancers even tend to be slow growing. However, um, malignancies were more likely to grow at least four millimeters per year. So that is a risk factor. So these nodules do require longer follow-up. Um, so at this point, um, both of the molecular tests did develop uh, new versions of their tests, and the firm is now called a GSC, relying on next generation sequencing, RNA-based still, and they cross-validated with their surgically resected nodules from their initial study. And so um, what they reported was in, uh, that the sensitivity was about the same, 91% versus 90% with GEC, but their goal was to improve specificity, and they did have a moderate improvement in specificity, and especially they wanted to focus on Herthel cell nodules because there's a very high false positive risk um, with Affirma GEC with Herthel cells. And that was one of the goals of GSC to improve the performance in Herthel cell nodules.
at the same time, ThyroSeq V3 was um, developed and validated, and this is a DNA and RNA still uh, based next generation sequencing, and they expanded to 112 genes. They did perform a prospective blinded multi-center study um, where they had surgical results on all the patients, including those with benign results. Um, and their goal, so you can see that actually the, the sensitivity goes from um, 91 to 98%, and the specificity um, goes down just a little bit from 92 to 82%. So their goal was to improve their sensitivity and to decrease the false negative results. So at this point, we continued the phase two of our study, randomizing patients in a similar design, block randomization by month, to affirm a GSC and ThyroSeq V3. So this was done across all UCLA sites from August 2017 to January 2020. And you can see that during that time, we performed biopsies of uh, 3,140 thyroid nodules. Of those, 14% of thyroid FNAs were indeterminate, Bethesda 3 or 4. Um, we had some exclusions, uh, for example, patients who also had a concurrent malignant biopsy, um, but because we had waiver of consent, we had, were able to enroll uh, virtually all of our patients. Ultimately, 372 thyroid nodules were randomized, 189 to affirm a GSC, and 157 to thyroseq V3. So these are the baseline characteristics of our patients, and mainly just to show you that they're very similar characteristics. Um, the median age is in the mid-50s, um, about 75% of patients were female. Um, the nodule size, the median nodule size is about two centimeters in both groups. And in our UCLA experience, most of the uh, indeterminate thyroid FNAs are Bethesda 3. However, when we have compared our results in Bethesda 3 and 4 in the past, they're actually not that different. Um, so the way that our uh, cytopathologists interpret this is um, not too much difference uh, in Bethesda 3 and 4. And about 13% had peripheral cell predominance. So this is sort of the core of our study outcomes. The first is to look at the benign call rate, so the percentage of patients that had a benign molecular test result. This is probably the most important value added from the molecular testing because most of these patients can avoid surgery. So GSC um, had an improvement from 43 to 53%. And ThyroSeq V3 had a slight decrease of 60% from 77% in the past. And this goes um, kind of in keeping with um, what I think uh, was the goal of ThyroSeq V3, which was to uh, have an improvement um, in the sensitivity um, at some sacrifice, perhaps, of the specificity. So now, when you look at the diagnostic performance of the test, they're very similar. So the specificity of a firma GSC is almost 80%, and that of ThyroSeq V3 is about 85%. And the PPV is 53% versus 63%. Um, now, again, this is assuming that nodules with a benign or negative molecular test result who are observed um, are, are truly benign. So when we compare the prior to the current test versions, if we look at GEC versus GSC, the specificity goes from 65 to 80%. And for ThyroSeq V2 and V3, the specificity remains very high at about 85%. So just to focus on the subset of nodules with herthal cell predominance on FNA, we had about 25 nodules in each group. The benign call rate for Affirma GSC has increased significantly. So again, in the past, Affirma GEC was almost always suspicious for herthal cell nodules, um, but it didn't mean that it actually ended up being malignant. So now with GSC, we do see that the benign call rate is very high. And in ThyroSeq B3, it's about 48%. Now, only a small handful of, of uh, thyroid nodules were benign. So this is not powered. Um, we would need about 60 nodules in each group to actually be powered to detect the difference. Um, it, however, based on these preliminary results, uh, we see that the specificity of a firma GSC may be higher for herthal cell nodules, 83% versus 58%. Uh, but again, this is based on very small number of patients that ended up having surgery. So all of the data that I was just showing was really focusing on diagnosis and the diagnostic ability of the molecular testing to help predict if a nodule is benign uh, versus malignant. 
However, there's also potential to look at prognosis. So we know that thyroid cancers are, are different uh, depending on what the mutational driver is. So the RAS-driven nodules here on the left, starting with the ultrasound appearance, they tend to be very isochoic with well-demarcated borders, no calcifications, uh, generally no spread to the lymph nodes. Oftentimes the thyroid FNA will be with as the three or four. The gross appearance is sort of soft, fleshy and tan, and the histopathology is usually low risk. Uh, they may be benign follicular adenomas, or they may be follicular variant of PTC, NIFP, or minimally invasive follicular thyroid cancers. Usually about a third are benign, a third are NIFP, and a third are malignant, uh, but usually kind of low risk malignancy. So these nodules um, are not very aggressive, have a low recurrence risk, um, and do not need to be treated very aggressively. And then looking at the BRAF driven tumors on the right here, they tend to be more hypochoic with microcalcifications, uh, more spread to the lymph nodes. More often, the thyroid FNA is malignant uh, with a best of five or six because we see nuclear grooves, pseudo-inclusions, and somoma bodies. The gross appearance is also different. They tend to be very hard tumors that are gritty and white and, uh, and are almost basically always papillary thyroid cancer, can be classic or tall cell variant. And these do have a, a higher recurrence risk um, and may require a little bit more aggressive treatment. So the molecular profile of indeterminate thyroid nodules is a little bit different than the molecular profile of known malignancies. So looking at this study, um, uh, the, the highest, uh, the most prevalent mutation in the indeterminate nodules are the RAS-like mutations that was seen in over 50% of indeterminate nodules. And again, some of these um, were follicular variant of PTC or NIFP. Um, and then uh, about 12% did have BRAF, and these were all classic PTC in the study. And only a small percentage of patients had these uh, combination high-risk mutations like uh, CHERT and RAS only about 2%, um, but those do tend to be much more aggressive. So currently, this, the uh, identification of specific mutations is only available in ThyroSeq. So these are the results from both of our studies, the phase one and the phase two. Um, and we do report the specific mutations that were identified um, and what the pathology ended up being. So you can see, for example, um, there are some RAS mutations that were in adenomatous nodules. Um, and uh, you know, still kind of smaller number of patients, but you can see the potential to identify the specific mutation to correlate that with the histopathology. So we did also look, uh, look at the results in the way that I mentioned. Um, and so when we look at the nodules in our study that had a RAS-like mutation, one third were benign, one third were NIFP, and about a third were malignant and all low risk cancers. The BRAF-like nodules were all malignant. 50% were classic papillary thyroid cancer, a quarter were tall cell, and a quarter were follicular variant of PTC. And then uh, in our study, the nodules that had a combination high-risk mutation, including TERT or TP53, were either follicular cancer, follicular variant of PTC, classic PTC, and we do see some poorly differentiated cancer here. So we can see the ability of the mutational status to prognosticate higher risk histopathology. And we know that these combination of BRAF and TERP mutations um, really impact patients' survival. So this was a study looking at um, patients with papillary thyroid cancer with a median follow-up of two years. And if you look at nodules, for example, that only had BRAF in the blue here, Here's their recurrence-free survival. If you have TERT alone, about the same, but the combination of BRAF and TERT, it really plummets the recurrence-free survival. So these are very high-risk cancers and require more aggressive care. So there's a similar interaction between uh, BRAF um, and, and uh, outcomes, but in particular, there have been kind of more nuanced data in the past few years looking at the interaction between BRAF and patient age and patient sex. So um, if we look at, uh, we know that older patients um, have, uh, tend to have perhaps more aggressive cancers, um, but in the study, it's the combination of having a BRAF B600E mutation and being older uh, that really increases the mortality rate with thyroid cancer. So this is the BRAF B600E in yellow here, and you can see that as patients get older, this is where the mortality rate starts to increase. 
However, patients that have BRAF wild type, and that's in the gray here, even as they get older, the mortality rate was actually similar. So it seems that perhaps the impact of patient age on mortality um, was dependent on BRAF status. And the group published a similar data looking at patient sex, um, where it was men that had a BRAF mutation, a BRAF B600E mutation, that had uh, more aggressive cancers. So this was an example of a patient that we had um, that had a Bethesda 4, suspicious for follicular neoplasm, and this was a TERT and uh, HRAS mutation. And we, uh, and we operated on this patient, and they did end up having poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. Now, most of these nodules will be very obvious on the ultrasound. Um, they will have a malignant FNA result, but rarely they will actually have an indeterminate result and the nodule may still look encapsulated on the ultrasound. So if we do identify this high-risk combination mutation, these are patients that have, should have a very high level of suspicion for lymph node metastatic disease, for local invasion, and should probably have a total thyroidectomy. Um, now, uh, this is just to point out, so is molecular testing really ready for prime time um, to kind of uh, supersede and take priority um, as to how we treat these nodules? I'm not sure. Um, so this was a woman I took care of several years ago now. Um, she was 59. She had a thyroid nodule palpated by her primary care doctor. You can see that it's hypoechoic, but with well-demarcated borders. The biopsy was Bethesda 4, uh, and the molecular testing was a TERP promoter mutation. So in the ThyroSeq, uh, this was with ThyroSeq uh, V2, and in the report, uh, they mentioned a 90% risk of malignancy. So the patient and I actually discussed the possibility of a total thyroidectomy. She did have a small contralateral thyroid nodule. However, ultimately she said, you know, there's a 10% risk that it's benign. I wanna take my chances and see. And this ended up being a benign purple cell adenoma that no matter how hard we looked, we could not find any capsular or vascular invasion. Um, so we, I have been surveilling her now just on the basis of that uh, TERP mutation and there's no recurrence at three years. So currently I believe that histopathology does remain the gold standard. So in summary, with our current results in our randomized trial, Affirma GSC and ThyroSeq V3 now have very similar diagnostic performance. Although before, ThyroSeq V2 had a higher benign call rate and specificity compared to Affirma GEC, the two tests now seem to have very similar diagnostic performance. Affirma has improved the benign call rate, especially in Herthel cell nodules and specificity compared to the prior test version of GEC. And ThyroSeq, I believe, likely improved their sensitivity while maintaining a very high specificity. We do need a greater sample size for Herthel cell nodules and our uh, subset analysis and studies ongoing for that. And we need long-term follow-up to detect false negatives. Um, and we're uh, continuing with that as well. Now, I didn't present this data, um, but we do uh, also have work that looks at the cost effectiveness. So for our study, we perform molecular testing routinely, uh, sent it reflexively for all Bethesda 3 and 4 nodules, primarily to not bias the results uh, by only sending it for some subset of perhaps uh, more suspicious or less suspicious nodules. However, when you look at the cost effectiveness, given the cost of the molecular testing, I do not believe it's cost effective on a clinical basis to perform molecular testing for all thyroid nodules. So we do need to look at clinical factors like nodule size, history, ultrasound characteristics to determine in which case would the molecular testing actually change our management. And then this very exciting part of prognostication of indolent versus aggressive cancers. So I mentioned the mutational stat, uh, information that's available in ThyroSeq. Uh, Verisite does have expression atlas um, that also has potential, uh, but is not yet clinically validated. And I think that in the future, we will probably be using this more and more, not just for the diagnosis of benign versus malignant thyroid nodules, but to help prognosticate indolent versus aggressive cancers and help determine the extent of treatment. So thank you very much. Um, thanks everybody for your attention. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Masha. Um, very nice presentation of a really important study. So I uh, really appreciate um, your uh, 
real clear presentation today, or is it really just excellent? Um, let me just uh, make sure I can see my full screen here. Bear with me just a second. All right. So um, I want to just uh, add a little kind of uh, context around the presentation that you gave, although I will say I think you did a great job of giving context anyway. Um, first of all, I do have some conflicts of interest, but none relevant to this presentation. I act as an advisory board participant and speaker for the um, drug companies you can see there. Um, I think Mash has done a great job of outlining the issue here. Uh, for the last decade or so, everyone's been looking for that molecular test that could exclude the need for diagnostic surgery and indeterminate cytology. And that molecular test has to have a sufficiently high negative predictive value that it can act as a rule out test, ruling out cancer and allowing us to observe the patient safely. Um, and it also has to have a, a high enough positive predictive value so that a positive result leads us to do a cancer type of surgery um, and the definitive surgery right up front. Um, and of course, there are two tests that have uh, really, I think, um, hit the requirement for clinical validation. Uh, the other tests that have been out there really lack this intense clinical validation, which is so important. And so um, I'm going to just summarize the performance of this test just in if we take 100 indeterminate cytology nodules, Bethesda 3 and 4 mixed together, and if we say the overall risk of malignancy in that group of samples is roughly 30%, then this is how these two tests perform. You can see here that um, Thyroseq version 3 would expect to have 59 benign calls there and 41 uh, positive calls with some kind of a mutation or a, a gene rearrangement or whatever. Of the negatives, 57 of the 59 would be true negatives, uh, two of the negatives would be false negatives. And of the positives, 28 out of the 41 would be true positives and 13 would be false positives. And this is based on the data from the pivotal clinical uh, utility study, uh, sorry, clinical validation study, I should say. For the Affirma GSC, um, the numbers are a little bit different. The positive calls are a little higher at 49. Uh, 27 of whom are true positives and 22 are false positives. And of the 51 uh, benign classifiers from the GSC, uh, 48 would be true negatives and three would be false negatives. So high sensitivity gives you few missed cancers, high specificity gives you more benign results, a higher benign call rate, and you really want both of those things. And here it looks like um, comparing the uh, two uh, clinical validation studies, a Thyroseq version 3 may be marginally better than the GSC. So I think it's important as we uh, see a real flourishing of the number of tests of this sort on the market, both in thyroid and in other types of malignancy, that we take a rigorous approach to what we would require of a test. Test implementation requires test development, it requires formal analytic validation, it requires clinical validation and ultimately clinical utility and cost-effectiveness studies as well. Both the Firma product and the Thyroseq product have really uh, effectively met these criteria for test development, for analytic validation, for clinical validation with a well-designed prospective um, blinded study, um, and for we're beginning to see the data for clinical utility. Um, but one of the things that's really key is that we have to seek additional independent validation studies. And uh, kudos to, the, to Dr. Livitz and her team for actually performing a study of this sort, putting these two uh, uh, tests side by side, even though it wasn't directly head to head. I think it's a remarkable effort and one that uh, deserves to be repeated in many other centers. And so you've uh, heard about the study and the conclusions were that uh, these tests allow approximately half of patients to avoid diagnostic surgery, um, and the performance of the two was very similar um, in terms of its um, negative and positive predictive value. Um, if we put the numbers on my little dendrogram here, um, the grayed out numbers are the ones I showed you earlier, and the uh, green and red numbers are the ones that were present in this uh, current study, the, the Limit study. So for Thyroseq version 3, the benign call rate was rather higher than we might have expected at 67. Um, and uh, that um, higher benign call rate means that we can avoid even more surgeries than we would expect to 
course, what we don't know is how many of those are true negatives and how many are false negatives. And of course, as Dr. Levitt's already pointed out, in these kind of post-marketing studies, it's really hard to convince a patient with a negative result to actually go to surgery unless there's some other suspicious features. On the positive side, the number of uh, uh, positives is known and the true positive and false positive numbers are, are pretty well known because about 80% of these patients did actually go to the operating room. On the Firma GSC, you can see here uh, that the um, positive numbers are a little lower. So uh, 19 of those positives uh, would be true positives and 17 would be false positives. So again, assuming that the um, that the tests are behaving this way, that's how the numbers would flow. Um, but the challenge again is the overall resection, because the overall resection rate in the benign uh, nodules and the ones with a negative gene sequencing classifier or a negative thyroid sequence version three, only about 11% of those patients went to the OR, whereas 80% of the patients went to the OR if they had a positive test. This is very typical for real-world post-marketing studies in the literature. Um, it is almost impossible in this day and age, at least in the United States, to do the real validation study where you take all patients to the operating room irrespective of the genetic result. And so we're stuck with these post-marketing data. The challenge with that is that there's a number of things you cannot know when you don't take the majority of patients with a benign result uh, to the operating room. If you have a, a negative test and you don't take them to the OR, you can't actually truly know the sensitivity and the specificity, and you certainly can't know the true rate of malignancy or risk of malignancy within this group of uh, patients. And so uh, what you can know is really only two things. You can know the benign call rate uh, because you know how many of your samples came out reported benign and how many came back reported suspicious or positive. And you can know the positive predictive value because the vast majority of the patients with a positive result did go to the operating room. And those are the only two variables you can truly know from a study like this. And the question is, how do you get from that to really knowing what the true sensitivity and specificity and risk of malignancy are? You've got two pieces of data and you can't unpack that and know the three pieces of data that are missing. Um, it's uh, entropy at work. Uh, so what that means is we have to make assumptions. We assume that the unresected nodules are benign. The trouble with thyroid nodules, even the cancerous ones, is that they are often very slow to grow and develop, uh, especially those RAS-driven nodules that uh, Marsha was talking about are often very slow, and so we need very prolonged follow-up, um, and even you know, sometimes even a decade or two goes by before we're actually seeing the malignant characteristics of these uh, nodules appear. And so um, it's very challenging then to know, are we dealing with um, a true negative or a false negative when all we're doing is observing it over a period of a few months or two or three years? So all we really know, the nine call rate, positive predictive value. And the question is, can we get some information out of it? Well, it turns out we can, because there's a clear correlation between the positive predictive value and the benign call rate. As Marsha already pointed out, if you have a high pretest probability of malignancy, the positive predictive value is higher, but also the benign call rate is lower. And so there's a correlation. And this is the correlation that you see here for Thyroseq version three based on the clinical validation study. And what I've done here is a Monte Carlo simulation with uh, I think 10,000 or 5,000 uh, runs through the uh, simulation, taking the 95% confidence interval for the sensitivity in that validation study 95% confidence interval for the specificity in that study, and a range of risk of malignancy ranging from zero to 100%. And you can see the scattergram represents the 95th, the 95% confidence interval for the relationship between PPV and benign call rate. The red mark there is the data that came out of the clinical validation study. It's right in the middle, as of course you would expect it would be. Uh, that was a 27% uh, risk of malignancy in that group and sensitivity and specificity as reported. So a repeat study of some sort, like the Livet study, um, can be mapped onto this graph uh, with its known positive predictive value and its known benign call rate, two things we truly know. If that um, correlation sits within this 95% confidence interval scatter, then we know that the study that we're talking about is consistent with the clinical validation study and it supports that clinical validity. 
and therefore it reassures us that, the, that this test is actually behaving as, as expected. And so if we map the Livitz uh, data onto this, that's where it lies. Um, and what we see here is that the results for Thyroseq version 3 are well within the confidence interval, supporting the data from Thyroseq version 3. And so these results are very consistent with the clinical validation study and support the use of Thyroseq version 3 uh, more broadly. We need many more of those studies, and we are actually doing the analysis right now with all of the published series to see what proportion of our studies sit within that 95% confidence interval. If this test is truly reliable, 95% of the studies will sit within that confidence interval. Um, so uh, this test, in other words, is supported by this real-world data. What about for the GSC? The shape of the curve is quite different because the sensitivity and specificity is a little different and it has a big impact on the positive predictive value and the benign call rate. This is that same 95% confidence interval with the data from the GSC study uh, right there in the red dot. Uh, so where does the Livet study lie? Outside of the confidence interval. So that's a little bit of a concern. It doesn't prove that the test isn't working, but it does call into question the reliability of the data either in this study and the way the GSE is performing in this population or in the original validation data, uh, which um, uh, you know, was a different patient population. And we've published these data um, looking at all of the different Affirma um, assays uh, compared to the original validation data. And we find a wide variety of uh, uh, studies that are outside of this confidence interval, really calling into question the reliability and the generalizability of the GSC. Um, the, one of the challenges, of course, with the GSC is it is something of a black box. We don't really know uh, what the algorithm is because it's a machine learning algorithm. And there may be subtle things that we're not recognizing that are actually influencing the performance of this test in the patient population in the real world. So in other words, these results are discordant with the GSC validation study. And does it not actually support that original clinical validation? It doesn't prove that it's inferior. It may well be that the test is actually performing better than was reported in the uh, GSC publication, but it certainly is different and that's a source of concern. Um, the other thing that is really important to emphasize is exactly what Marshall was talking about earlier, that there's data information in the positive results and the data in those positive results is most useful when we have um, specifics around the nature of the mutation or the rearrangement that we're dealing with and Nash has already mentioned that BRAF driven uh, nodules nodules that have BRAF B600E are going to be papillary thyroid cancer almost every single time RAS alone often is driving a pre-malignant or a car an early stage carcinoma uh, of the follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer or a NIFT-P or a follicular thyroid cancer. And of course, the combination of RAS and TERT or BRAF and TERT gives you prognostic information, much higher risk that you're dealing with cancer and a cancer that carries much more risk to the patient. And so as a consequence, I think that these more granular data are going to increasingly have the utility as we begin to tailor the management of these patients in more of a precision oncology way. Um, we've all become more and more familiar with the concept that our follicular-derived thyroid nodules are on a spectrum between classic BRAF-driven classical papillary thyroid cancers and the RAS-driven follicular thyroid cancer or follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancers. And this spectrum is something that I think we need to begin to use in our thought process because we're dealing here with spectrum disease. RAS-driven tumors are often on an adenoma benign to carcinoma malignant sequence. And so it shouldn't be surprising that RAS-driven tumors are often actually benign adenomas. But I would argue that those adenomas have malignant potential because they're monoclonal, and if they progress, they will eventually transition at an unknown rate into a malignant process. So there's still surgical disease in many cases, and certainly the larger ones are uh, surgical disease um, uh, uh, because they're monoclonal and have neoplastic and malignant potential. So I think we're moving away from that binary construct where the purpose of molecular testing is to identify those patients who can benign and can safely be watched, and those that are cancer. Instead, we're dealing here with a spectrum disease where we will have many samples that are negative, have no mutations. Both tests give us very high negative predictive value, 
those patients are very safe to observe and watch, and I really don't have any concerns about it. But when a test is positive, stratifying that risk into the high-risk mutations uh, that require a therapeutic total thyroidectomy, plus and minus neck dissection, uh, that we can make those decisions increasingly based on the genetic drivers of the disease. And then those uh, many uh, nodules that have low risk mutations where we're dealing likely with either pre-malignant or very early malignant disease where a therapeutic lobectomy is an appropriate way forward. And taking this approach, we've moved away from where we believed molecular markers were taking us five to seven years ago, which actually was in the direction of more aggressive surgery because we were treating all the RAS mutants as if they were cancer and doing total thyroidectomy. Now to this much more nuanced approach where a RAS mutant in a modestly sized thyroid nodule with a not worrying ultrasound, those individuals are going for that minimal surgery, the lobectomy, and we're avoiding the need for them downstream uh, consequences with thyroid hormone in the majority of those patients and minimizing the surgical risk. So I do believe that the granular data, data available from the positive results is helpful in deciding how to manage these patients. Um, so in summary, molecular markers in the US are increasingly being used in clinical practice and are rapidly becoming standard of care. The guidelines already support their use, uh, both in the ATA guidelines, the NCCN guidelines and others. The pivotal clinical validation studies certainly support the use both of the Affirma assay and the UPMC thoracic assay, although there is a bit of concern about the reliability of the Affirma data based on the analysis I've just shown you. Uh, it's true to say that true independent validation studies are really completely lacking in the field, and that's an unfortunate uh, occurrence for us. Uh, but nonetheless, these post-marketing studies can actually be compared to the pivotal studies and we can begin to gather how reliable those pivotal studies really are and whether we need to look back and again do the validation study. Um, both the NPV and the implications of a positive result are part of the value proposition here. Um, the driver mutation information can help to guide the treatment because we really need to consider not just the risk of malignancy, is this a cancer or not, binary construct, but rather, what is the risk that the patient faces from this neoplasm? Um, are we dealing here with something that is high risk and needs aggressive treatment, or low risk, which needs minimal treatment, or benign, which needs no treatment at all? So with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Gosh, thank you both very much. That was uh, absolutely terrific um, and really enlightening. Um, I think probably the best way for me to start here would be to uh, just address some of the questions that have come in, and then I've got a whole set of my own here. Um, so one of our first questions is, um, uh, for a Bethesda 4 nodule uh, with a RAS mutation, what is your recommendation? So I would recommend for uh, um, this uh, type of patient either a thyroid lobectomy or, uh, or observation with active surveillance. And it will depend on the ultrasound features and the patient factors. Um, so perhaps in an 85-year-old uh, with other medical comorbidities with an intrathyroidal nodule, this patient could just be observed. Um, in a uh, young patient, um, you know, more likely perhaps to have a diagnostic lobectomy. Yeah, and I, I certainly agree with what Dr. Levitz is saying there. I think that um, you know, a RAS mutation indicates clonality, which indicates neoplasm, which indicates the potential for uh, transition to malignancy. Um, we would also use the size of the nodule as an indicator of whether to safely observe or whether to move ahead with a surgery. I think that you know, there's pretty good evidence that uh, size does matter in this game. And uh, Yuri Nikiforov, I think, has data probably not yet published that suggests that nodules over about two and a half to three centimeters that are RAS mutant alone much more likely to be early stage malignancy, whereas the smaller ones much less likely. So we um, use, there's no absolute threshold here, but we use in our discussion with the patients a kind of boundary of about one and a half to two centimeters. Things that are bigger than that, we're leaning on the patient to go to surgery with these things. Things that are smaller than that, at least we offer that observation. Okay, uh, thank you. And so one of our um, attendees has asked the question, so what's the bottom line? Which of these uh, two tests do you recommend using? Um, and a, a follow-on question to that is, how, does, um, how do clinicians who may not know the exact 
rate um, of malignancy in their particular um, institution. How do they um, interpret this data? Um, and and because obviously this is going to be will vary tremendously if you are in a community-based setting versus in a um, a, a tertiary referral center. How how do we um, how do we pass uh, how do we pass judgment on this? Maybe if you can address the first one. What's the bottom line? Uh, do you recommend either um, ThyroSeq or Affirma now? Um, so I'll, I'll address the first one. I think that in our uh, in, the, in our study, the test performance, uh, diagnostic performance is very similar. So then we look at other factors like inadequacy rate, which I did not report, but is actually a little bit lower for ThyroSeq in terms of sending the molecular test and not having adequate uh, tissue sample to, to give a result of the molecular testing. The turnaround time, which is similar, the cost of the test, which is very similar. Um, and if all of that is fairly equal, then I think that the ability um, to prognosticate cancers based on the specific mutational status um, currently has the edge to ThyroSeq. So to address the second question, um, the uh, how does an individual in a community practice or in an academic practice that hasn't looked at their own data, um, how do they know how this test is going to perform? Because as was pointed out, uh, in the, um, in the presentation, uh, the performance of these assays is critically dependent on sensitivity, specificity, and the underlying risk of malignancy. And those uh, McIver grams with the curves going up or down with the PPV and NPV um, really do demonstrate that if you're dealing with a, a group of patients that has a 95% probability of malignancy, you can't trust a negative result because the NPV is going to be very low. If you're dealing with a a population that has a 5% risk of malignancy, then you're probably going to be less relying on the positive result because that's more likely a false positive reading, no matter what you do. So at some level, you have to at least use your judgment on this if you're in a practice that hasn't formally analyzed the data. I would argue that all academic centers should already know these data or should be analyzing these data because they have access to the cytology, they have access to the pathology, they should be actually know the numbers. Um, but in a private community setting, that definitely is much harder. So all you can do is use your gut judgment. Uh, you know the patients that you've done this test, uh, these tests on. You know the ones that you've taken to the OR. If all of the Bethesda 4s you've taken to the OR are benign, then you have a low probability of malignancy. If the vast majority of the indeterminate nodules that you've sent to the OR are cancers, then you've got a high probability of malignancy. Uh, for most of us, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Great. Um, one of our uh, questions came in about the role of molecular testing during pregnancy. Um, can you comment on that? Um, I try not to do biopsies on women who are pregnant unless there's something really worrying about the nodule. So if I see a, a questionable nodule, you know, an intermediate suspicion nodule by ATA criteria, it's intrathyroidal, um, it's two or three centimeters, I'm going to avoid doing the biopsy until that pregnancy is complete. Uh, I would certainly watch that nodule probably through the pregnancy if this is a first trimester situation. If it's growing in the second trimester, that might change my view. Uh, but most of these things are very indolent over the course of a pregnancy, and I would simply follow by ultrasound. If a nodule is uh, a nodule undergoes biopsy during that pregnancy and it's indeterminate cytology, uh, I have no reason to believe that the uh, genetic profile is going to be different during pregnancy. So thyroseq should be very reliable. Um, a firma GSC does include a number of inflammatory markers, um, which increase the sensitivity of that test. Uh, those inflammatory markers could theoretically change during the pregnancy because of alterations in the immune system. And so there's an uncertainty there about how it might impact on the GSC. Great. So could you, both of you comment um, on the role of molecular testing in um, uh, from a prognostic perspective for um, Bethesda 5 and 6, are we at a point now, um, and I'm not sure if this is an insurance question or not, where we should be relying on molecular information to guide uh, decisions regarding active surveillance or immediate surgery, um, the extent of surgery, and the role of radioactive iodine? So uh, I think that's the direction that we all feel we're headed, um, but we don't yet have sufficient prospective data to really tell us that it's, um, it's time for the 
for us to do that on routine patients. Uh, you know, if you look at the, having said that, the, the ATA guidelines currently say, you know, it's okay to do a lobectomy for something that's up to four centimeters. And four centimeter nodules often do have some of these higher risk features. Um, and often those higher risk features could have been predicted by the genetic profiling. So if you are looking for a, a value proposition for molecular testing, it would be in a situation where you're trying to decide between a total thyroidectomy and a lobectomy in a larger nodule or a nodule with some kind of worrying features on the ultrasound. And there it may be that the genetic testing, particularly with the specific gene uh, test, the thyroseq version three, maybe there's going to be a value to that. But we need the clinical studies to prove it, and none of those studies have yet been done. I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I would add to that also the decision about active surveillance versus surgery in smaller cancers, knowing the mutational status um, probably would guide our, our decisions in the future. I also agree that we're moving in that direction, um, but also agree that we don't yet have the clinical data, particularly putting the cost of the test um, kind of into this discussion. So currently it is not covered by insurance to do for the best of five and six nodules. I personally would love to have that information on, on all of my patients, uh, but we don't yet know, you know, um, the nodules that do have the higher risk mutations, a lot of them will already have more aggressive features on the ultra sound. Um, so how many of those will we have caught anyway because they have lymph node spread or they have obvious gross invasion and how many of them really could only be detected by the mutational um, information. Um, so we really need that clinical, we really need those studies to determine um, how, how much will having that mutational information change our management uh, besides the other you know, clinical factors that we have, like ultrasound, to justify the cost of the test. Great. Um, that's uh, terrific answers here. My question um, really relates to a comment, um, Brian, that you made regarding um, that you may have a higher risk mutation and find out that your histology um, uh, turns out to be a benign um, nodule. And it, it brings up the bigger question of uh, not benign versus malignant, but malignant with a high-risk mutation, but the histology is not demonstrating um, high-risk features. Where do you go with that in your mind? What, um, uh, how does that guide uh, your plan of care after you have that information? So um, I'm a great fan of, uh, of Ronald Reagan uh, when he taught, was negotiating with the Russians. And one of the things he said about one of the treaties, we're going to trust but verify. And so I take that approach with my patients and quote Ronald and say, um, you know, this looks histologically benign, but there were some worrying features on the genetic side of this. Uh, we're going to trust that it's benign, but we're going to verify by following it as if it was cancer. And I think that most patients kind of really can buy into that. We get a little laugh out of it and everybody can move on happy. But what about um, what about if it's malignant and your histology shows um, either garden variety or, or not so concerning histologic features, but perhaps you've got a TERT mutation um, uh, in there? And um, so, how do you does that influence your your management for a malign so, for a true malignancy? Not yet. Uh, if you're asking, you know, for example, around a decision for radioactive iodine, we base that on histology. We don't really use the genetic profiling yet to guide us there. Uh, again, because we just don't have the, the data, either prospective or retrospective, to tell us that that matters. So we do still use the histology as the gold standard, as, as uh, Dr. Livitz mentioned earlier. Um, but obviously, we're collecting those data prospectively to try and understand whether we should change our track. And I would just add that the only thing that may change, for example, that would uh, make me decide to do a total thyroidectomy would be the combination high-risk mutations. So I think TERT alone, maybe not quite enough data, but a TERT plus RAS or BRAF, um, that would really, that would be like the only combination that would make me think about being more aggressive in treatment. Um, and does that include uh, an, um, the decision to remove lymph nodes at the time of surgery? Um, how, do, how granular do we get in guiding surgical management here? Yeah, I mean, so I think, for, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Marshall. 
Uh, currently, uh, we still rely heavily on ultrasound. I think those are patients, I mean, all patients who are having a thyroid cancer operation need lymph node mapping and evaluation with preoperative ultrasound. If you know the mutational status is aggressive, uh, you need to really scrutinize the lymph nodes carefully. I don't think we're at the point yet of doing a prophylactic lymph node dissection based on mutational status alone, um, but, you know, maybe more studies will reveal that. The flip side of that coin is that we know that pure RAS driven lesions are very unlikely to involve lymph nodes. And the question from a resource utilization perspective is how valuable is that preoperative ultrasound when we're dealing with a RAS driven tumor? Um, and so we're actively looking at those data right now to try and determine whether we could drop some of the preoperative testing for things that we know are RAS driven. Um, but again, all of these data need to be uh, solidly studied in prospectively collected, retrospectively analyzed data sets. Great. Um, unfortunately, um, we have to, uh, we are pushing the nine o'clock hour and we have to come to a close here. Um, I want to thank both of you uh, for taking the time to um, really uh, do both give outstanding presentations and congratulate um, Dr. Libitz on an outstanding study. Um, we hope that uh, we'll get some more follow-up on these patients uh, as the data matures, and uh, hopefully we'll see some more information about them. Um, I want to just everybody um, uh, give you a heads up that next week uh, promises to be uh, an equally informative and very entertaining lecture by Dr. Shaha, uh, so we encourage you to, um, uh, to join in. And everybody stay safe, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye now.